Viewers, those of you who have spent time in the Jehovah's Witness religion will know all about attendance. Basically, when you go to a Jehovah's Witness convention or assembly, there is an army of volunteers, usually with special badges or with special lanyards or with special fluorescent vests, whose responsibility it is to basically shepherd the crowd and get people to and from their seats safely. Now, although this is a voluntary arrangement, there is typically a lot of training that goes into being an attendant, and attendants are typically asked to attend a long training session in the build-up to the event to familiarize themselves with the rules, with the operation plan, etc. But it seems that in recent years, Watchtower has turned to its video production machine to make attendant training more uniform. And as a result, we have a leaked attendant training video to show you. The original video is a number of hours long, I've just taken some of the clips that I find fascinating and worthy of discussion. So without further ado, let's roll the first clip. All of you serving as attendants play an important role at our conventions, our assemblies, our congregation meetings, and other theocratic events. In fact, your work has never been more important. We might say that the attendants are on the front lines of such gatherings, ensuring that everyone is warmly welcomed, encouraged, and protected. It goes without saying that we live in critical times, and true to Bible prophecy, we've seen evidence that wicked men have advanced from bad to worse. We have also seen how these last days have profoundly affected our brothers and sisters, many of whom deal with chronic personal and family challenges, as well as physical and emotional limitations. That means we need to be ready to assist them and to be sensitive to the needs of all in attendance. Well, with a warm smile, you have the privilege to welcome all to a place of worship where the atmosphere is like a spiritual oasis in a parched land. And by taking the initiative to offer a helping hand, you can be like those streams of cool water that bring refreshment to all. And by promoting a safe and peaceful environment, you can provide a place of concealment for all of our invited guests, but especially the elderly and the infirm ones. It's as if our great host, Jehovah, has extended his welcoming arms by means of you, so that everyone in attendance will feel like they've entered a home that is safe and secure. Remember, too, you will not be working alone in behalf of God's people. Psalm chapter 34, verse 7 assures us, the angel of Jehovah camps all around those fearing him. So by means of his powerful angels, Jehovah can shield his faithful worshipers from harm, if it be his will. So I found these opening remarks fascinating. Bear in mind that being an attendant is basically about getting people from their cars or from the moment they enter the event space, getting them to their seats safely, 
making sure that while they're in the event space, they are safe, that they are taken care of, that they can be directed to wherever it is they need to go. And then once the event is over, making sure that they get home safely or at least get to their car safely. That's what being an attendant is all about. But it seems Watchtower can't make a video training people on how to do this without making that video have a flavour of its kind of doomsday fears and paranoias. And what's interesting is that as we see more of these videos, more clips from these videos, we see even more hints at how controlling and cult-like the Jehovah's Witness religion has become. Without a doubt, the care and protection of Jehovah's sheep are a priority, and you attendants play a vital role in carrying out this sacred duty. So please pay careful attention to all that is presented. As your convention draws near, be sure to meditate on what you have learned so as to prepare your heart for this assignment and to truly enjoy the privilege of serving your brothers and sisters in such a special way. So I've included that brief clip for two reasons. First of all, again, we're talking about stewards. We're talking about attendants whose job it is to get people in and out of the venue safely. And yet the job, which is a voluntary job that no one's being paid for, is being talked up as though it's hugely significant. There are even scriptures quoted if you watch the whole thing. And attendants are asked to prepare their hearts and meditate in advance of this assignment. And you see people there praying with their Bibles, with the, with the ground plan of the event arena, <laughs> as though it's this massive, massive deal. Sure, it's important that people are safe, but I don't think it merits this level of melodrama. And it's also interesting to hear the brother there talk about the protection of Jehovah's people. He says, without a doubt, the care and protection of Jehovah's sheep are a priority. And I want you to remember those words because later among the clips, we're gonna see a clip about what happens when a child get lo gets lost. And I think that there are some interesting points to note about contrasting the whole issue of child safety in an event arena with what we know about Jehovah's Witnesses and their mishandling of child sex abuse. Now consider for a moment the variety of individuals that attend our conventions and assemblies. Are they just a crowd to you or do you see them as Jesus does? as individuals with unique circumstances and needs. Reminding ourselves of those we serve is vital as we represent Jehovah, the primary host for all such sacred gatherings. Let's look in on the journey of five different people with varying circumstances. These situations are not uncommon. In fact, it's likely you have or will encounter each one in your work as an attendant. As you view the video, think about how knowing the struggles of each one would influence the way you would deal with them if they came to your convention. Good morning, Betty. It's convention day. I wish you could come.
Good morning. Good morning. This is for you, Sister Day. Oh, thank you. Looks like you're ready for the convention. Oh, of course I'm ready. Let me get my things. So we're being introduced here to a series of characters. As you've heard, uh, the objective is for attendants to sympathize with the different scenarios that are depicted because they might encounter individuals who are going through similar things. And first up is Sister Day, who is an older sister. And you have this kind of dramatic introduction where it's showing the, Re the Rutherford record and you also see the old uh, collection of old Watchtower books. I just found that part of the video unintentionally poignant, but for reasons other than the video was intended, because for me, the emotions I was feeling when it was showing that, you know, the, the walker and um, clearly this is an old person who's been in the organization for decades. What was going through my mind was, what a waste, you know, how wasteful that this person has devoted decades in service to an organization that was saying, the end is coming, the end is coming, the end is coming. And throughout all of those decades, the end never comes. But even in her twilight years, she still believes passionately, well, this is the truth, it has to be the truth, the end is coming any moment now. And to add insult to injury, you see this, you know, fresh young family come to the door. Here's a flower, Sister Day. And you see the cycle repeating itself. You see new generations being kind of led along into this never-ending cycle of expectation, which is what being a Jehovah's Witness is all about. It's like three days. Friday through Sunday starts in the morning around 9.30, lunch break, ends at around 4. So, what do you think? I'll try to make it. Great. Hope to see you there, man. You're not seriously thinking of going, are you? Why not? My cousin is a Jehovah. And he basically cut himself off from the family. It's what they make you do, you know. I had no idea. I had no idea. Typical cult. Be careful. I knew it was too good to be true. So this is a fascinating little clip. One of the characters that we're introduced to is Eddie. We find out that's his name later on in the in the videos. And Eddie is witnessed to at work and invited to the convention, but his colleague overhears and interjects to say, listen, be careful. What's fascinating is that Watchtower here has an opportunity to portray so-called opposers and to show what kind of arguments a Jehovah's Witness or someone who's interested in becoming a Jehovah's Witness, what kind of arguments they might be exposed to. And the best they can come up with is, oh, my cousin's a Jehovah. Uh, he basically cuts himself off from the family. It's what they make you do, you know. Typical cult. That's apparently the most compelling argument. And by the way, there's some truth to that. Because when you become a Jehovah's Witness, you learn to think of non-Jehovah's Witnesses differently. Even if they're family members, you understand that their attitudes, the fact that they're not dedicated to Jehovah and dedicated to 
fulfilling the requirements placed on them by the organization, you learn to think of them as bad association. So that although you won't necessarily outright shun them, you might find yourself tempted to at least think about withdrawing from them. So we're now introduced to the next character who is an inactive lady who was baptized as a Jehovah's Witness and later faded from the organization. And I can't help but be irritated whenever I see this whole thing of witnesses getting baptized at a ridiculously young age. That is one thing that always grates at me, this emphasis on getting witnesses baptized really young before they know who they are, before they have, before they're old enough to sign a contract or get a job or own property. No, we want you to pledge yourselves to a religion for life with crushing penalties if you ever change your mind. But she has these uh, flashbacks to getting baptized because it seems she has uh, become inactive. But what's interesting is that whenever Watchtower portrays inactive people in the JW Broadcasting episodes and here as well, they present this stereotypical image of someone who's miserable, of someone who is depressed and unhappy because they are separated from Jehovah's spiritual paradise. In the minds of Watchtower or the, the Watchtower's writing department, it's inconceivable you could walk away from Jehovah's Witnesses and lead a happy, fulfilled, meaningful life. In their minds, you're going to spend every minute of every day looking mournfully into the window or, uh, or reflecting on how wonderful your life could have been if you'd stayed with Jehovah's organization. And another thing that's worth noting about this segment is that the inactive woman hears about the convention on the radio. It's announced on the radio there's going to be 
a convention and there are 7,500 witnesses attending, well, how interesting, because as witnesses, we were told that the newspapers, the radio, the television, they're all against Jehovah's Witnesses. So you should never expect to hear anything positive or even neutral about Jehovah's Witnesses in Satan's media. But what's interesting is that whenever you have the convention season, you go online and you find there are newspaper articles, all sorts of things that are um, pointing people towards the conventions and giving very flattering reviews of, of the local conventions, local reporters, that is, writing about the conventions. So it simply doesn't hold true. If it is Satan's media, then quite clearly Satan's media isn't as interested in persecuting and criticising Jehovah's Witnesses as you would think. Mama, we're going to be late. Bye, Dad. Bye, have fun. Bye, Dad, have fun. You too, bye. Enjoy yourself. Oh, thanks, honey. You're welcome, have fun. Thanks. Be safe. Todd! Todd! You're gonna make your mom late. Hurry up. So much fun. Hopefully there's gonna be parking. There's no, never parking. Wanna... Hey, Todd. Hey. Isn't this awesome? I'm really glad you're coming with us today, Todd. Did I have a choice? Someday you will have a choice, and hopefully by then you'll choose to come on your own. I doubt that. So this, for me, is the most disturbing part of the attendant training videos. And frankly, it was this scenario that swung the decision to make this rebuttal, because this really strikes close to home. We have here a teenager being raised by his Jehovah's Witness mother, who is being shown, being coerced emotionally to go along to this event, even though he doesn't want to go. And he says, did I have a choice? And his mother says, someday you will have a choice and hopefully by then you'll choose to come on your own. And he kind of mutters, I doubt that. This is apparently what Jehovah's Witness parents are supposed to do, is drag their children along to these events, whether they want to go or not. And quite frankly, if you are a Jehovah's Witness parent, why wouldn't you do that? Because in your mind, if you don't drag your child along to these events, whether they want to go or not, there's a higher chance that they'll be destroyed at Armageddon. That's what's at stake here. And I, al I already have interviewed, well, you'll, you'll have seen hopefully my interview with Shana Rubio, who eventually gave her daughter up for adoption because she was terrified that her daughter wouldn't make it through Armageddon because Shana was disfellowshipped. What we're going to see in this scenario is a very visceral portrayal of the kind of emotional trauma a parent goes through when their child, when they think that their child might be drifting from the organisation and therefore liable to be destroyed at Armageddon. We're going to see this as the videos progress. But what's also interesting is that they pass Todd's father, who I think it's safe to say is getting ready to go out for a day of leisure. I think he's putting his golf clubs in the back of the car. And 
she walks, Todd's mother walks past her husband and everything's, oh, have, have a good day, dear. Oh, you have a good day too. There's no concern at all about the fact that her husband isn't a Jehovah's Witness and isn't coming to the convention and therefore will be destroyed or would be destroyed if Armageddon came tomorrow. All of the emphasis is on Todd. Apparently it's, it's a, a tragedy, as we're going to see, a tragedy that, Todd's doesn't, that Todd is uh, only going to the convention because he, is being, he feels he has to, he feels he has no other choice. Just perfect. Thanks, Mommy. I love you. You ready? Ready. So our fifth character is revealed to be a single mother with a disabled daughter and it's quite an emotionally charged segment because she's um, going to great lengths to get her daughter ready for the convention. You see when she puts the wheelchair away she takes a moment to seemingly pray or pause before she gets in the car and drives to the convention. But anyway, these are our five characters that attendants are being asked to watch and learn from. And we're now going to go to the next part of the story. In other words, when these characters arrive at the convention venue. While it's true that we cannot read their hearts like Jesus could when he viewed the crowds, we might be able to read their faces or read their body language perceiving their struggle as we watch them from afar or as they pass by. Let's go back to the video and watch as these same five people continue their journey to the convention and meet up with attendants who care for their needs. Even though the attendants are unaware of their personal circumstances, notice how they perceive a need, take the initiative to assist, and thus help enhance the spiritual paradise for these families and many others. As you watch, put yourself in the attendant's shoes. How would you have handled each situation? Would you have shown the same fellow feeling and care even without knowing their struggles? What can their example teach us? Good morning, sister. 
Welcome to the convention. So even though Todd and his family have arrived at the convention venue, Todd decides to stay in the car. And his mother is quite clearly distressed at this decision, but her distress becomes even more palpable as we continue with this dramatization. Good morning, sisters. Good How morning. are you? Hello, brother. Is there anything in your trunk that I can help you with? That would be great. Okay, I'll be glad to get that for you, okay? All right. Hi, my sister. Good to see you. Thank you, brother. Good morning. I'm David. I'm Eddie. Eddie, it's nice to meet you. Is this your first time here? Yeah, yeah it is. Um, I have a coworker who's one of Joe's witnesses. He was, he was telling me a little about the event. Don't cry, Mommy. Good to see you. How you been? I've been okay. Good, good. good to see you too. You mentioned been having with I know, it's really good. So Todd's mother continues to be visibly anguished just because her son is staying in the car. And this may seem ridiculous and overly melodramatic, and to an extent it is overly melodramatic, but it's important to remember that in her mind, her beloved son is drifting from God's one and only true organization. He needs to not just be at the convention, he needs to be willing to take in the instruction if he is going to make it through Armageddon, which is apparently going to be coming imminently. At least if you're a Jehovah's Witness, that's what you're trained to believe. So frankly, if Todd's mother was indifferent to her son not wanting to be there, there would be something wrong. If she really believes that Armageddon is coming and that all who reject the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses will be destroyed at Armageddon, her traumatized behavior makes perfect sense. I think it's also worth saying something here about the disabled girl because when the car arrives, the car pulls up, the attendant asks, um, do you need help with anything? Is there anything in the back that I can get out for you? And the mother doesn't say, yes, there's a wheelchair. She just says, yes, we do need help. And he opens up, I think it's called the trunk, you, you Americans call it. And there he sees the wheelchair and is visibly shaken once he realizes that the girl is disabled. And of course, I'm, I'm not disabled. I don't know what it's like to be a disabled Jehovah's Witness or to grow up as a disabled Jehovah's Witness. But I can imagine it's a fairly unique experience because you are being told that the way to the way past your problems, the way to physical perfection, the way to overcome your uh, your disabilities is to stay as close as possible to Jehovah's organization to survive Armageddon and then you will be given this perfect new body and then you will be rid of all of your uh, disabilities. I can imagine that being emotionally very difficult to deal with and another reason why you would be emotionally attached to the beliefs even if they didn't make sense so that you would have even less reason to explore your beliefs from an objective or critical standpoint because you've been given this cruel promise of 
relief for your uh, difficulties, for your disabilities, once the paradise comes, you're going to be even less inclined to find out whether you've been lied to or not, especially if you've invested years or decades in serving the organisation under the false assumption that by doing so, you will be given this perfect new body. Awesome. Good. All right, well, I'll see you later. All right. Bye. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. Oh, uh, no problem. Is everything okay? That's exactly what I wanted to ask you. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm just not feeling too good. Well, can I get you a bottle of water? You must be hot in this van. You know what? I was just about to come out. Great. Can I walk you in? Sure, sounds good. My name's Charles. What's your name? Uh, Todd. Todd, nice to meet you. Where are you from? Uh, South Central. South Central. Come on in. We have plenty in this section. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Uh, I'm good. Great. How many seats do you need? It's just me. Let's get you a seat. Thank you. Watch your step. Right here. You know him? Yeah. Well, that was easy. Enjoy the program. Man, I'm so excited to see you. You know, something inside me told me you were gonna be here. I'm so glad you came. I'm glad, me too. Hey, I have a seat for you. You can come sit with my family right down here. So Eddie, who has ignored the warnings that Jehovah's Witnesses might be a cult, has arrived at the venue and miraculously has been taken to the exact seating section where his Jehovah's Witness co-worker and his family are sitting. So that worked out well. And we also see Todd relent in his refusal to get out of the car when he's shown some kindness by an attendant. He finally decides to join his mother and sister and brother inside and we see in the next segment what effect that has. Thank you, brother. Oh, be careful, be careful, my friend. Thank you, good job, good job. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Three? No, four, my son is coming. No problem, no problem. Thank you. Okay, I've got the perfect seat for you right down there. Just follow that brother. Thank you. Good morning, brother. Good morning. Thank you, Jehovah. Mom, is everything all right? Everything's perfect. Hi, sister. May I help you to your seat? Oh, yes, thank you so much. Hi, Trinette. How's Bella? She's doing well, thank you. I see the boys are growing. Thank you. Sister, is there anything else I can help you with? No, I think we're set. Okay. Thank you.
So I have to say, this feels like emotional overkill for a video that is intended to train attendants in their duties. This is very melodramatic. We hear there the stirring music as each of the characters eventually find their way to their seats. Um, but again, I, I can't help but comment on how disturbing that whole thing with Todd's mother is. And the reaction you see when when she gets the text message, presumably Todd saying, where are you sitting? And she's saying, thank you, Jehovah. And her daughter says, you know, what's happening? What's wrong? And she says, everything's perfect. And then later you see her embracing Todd as though he's come back from the dead almost, which in her mind, he kind of has. But I just find it fascinating that Watchtower can't make a video intended to train crowd stewards, essentially, without injecting their cultishness and their control and without giving this whole spin of if you don't attend, something really, really bad is going to happen and you should be worried if your child isn't going to attend. And what I found... I think especially upsetting or disturbing from my point of view. Obviously, I am now disassociated. My father is an elder and he is shunning me. As far as I'm aware, my dad is an attendant. So he will have been sat through this whole series of videos. By the way, I don't know whether this these videos are for this year or the year before. I have a feeling these are either brand new videos for this year or they're from last year. But my dad will have sat through these videos in preparation for his assignment as an attendant at the convention. And here he is being shown this happily ever after where the child, the errant child is reunited and, and relents and decides to come to the convention and there's this hugely emotional embrace What's going to be going through his mind when he thinks about me? And, you know, what's going to be going through the minds of any attendant who is watching these videos and has a disfellowshipped or disassociated child? I think that it's quite insensitive to portray, again, this happily ever after scenario where everything works out when you're an organisation that is breaking apart families and saying to parents that unless their children uh, stick with the organisation, they will be worthy of destruction at Armageddon, which is what all of this is about. All of the emotion that we've seen from Todd's mother is a very visceral response to the Armageddon teaching, which says that if you are not associated with Jehovah's people, if you go so far as to learn about Jehovah's Witness teachings and then reject them, you're worthy of death when Armageddon comes. And by the way, Armageddon is coming any moment now. Parking and drop-off and pickup areas for the elderly and infirm should be properly staffed. Practical assistance should be offered with navigating wheelchairs especially on sidewalks, handling bags, and escorting persons to designated entry points. Attendants assigned to the drop-off pickup area should be at their assignment prior to arrival, be ready to provide practical assistance, use sisters as volunteers to provide support. So I've shown this brief clip because it's one of two clips that I'm going to show you where it seems to be quite obvious that sisters have this secondary role or they are there to, they are at the disposal of, of men. Women, as you know, if you have spent any time as a Jehovah's Witness, it's a different organisation or a different religion altogether. If you are a female Jehovah's Witness, you are not entitled to have any uh, role of authority, you're not allowed to preach, you're not, sorry, you are allowed to preach, but you're not allowed to teach. You are in a subservient role to men in the organisation, and I, I just feel as though that comes across there in that brief clip. There's another more glaring example 
of the way women are looked down on coming up later. Hey, honey. Hey, babe. We're straight to see with your mom. No, I just left mom at the seat. I thought he was with you. With me? Why would you think that? Because when you got up to go to the bathroom, he followed right behind you. Are you kidding me? Okay, let's not panic. Let's go back to the seat. He's probably with Tommy. No, no, let's split up. Okay, good idea. I will call Tommy's dad and then head back to the seat. Okay, I'm gonna go find an attendant. Okay, do you have your phone? Yeah, just call me as soon as you get there. Okay. My son is missing. Let me call the lost and found right now for you. Oh yeah, Bill, if you can ask his mother if she has a picture of Jaden on her smartphone, that will really help us. Oh, okay, all right, we're on our way. We haven't seen him yet, but soon every attendant in this building is gonna know we're looking for Jaden. We will find him. We've, we've got attendants going over to your seating section right now. Okay. Now, do you have a picture of Jaden on your phone? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, all right, all right, good. Let's, let's go. Got the message. Excuse me, brother, just need to check something. Okay. Is everything okay? It is, we're just looking for a lost child. Oh, I'm sorry. I hope we find him. I do too. Thank you. Thank you. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. I'm Jeff Turner. Hi, Jeff. So, so what we did, we sent out pictures to all the attendants, as well as the parking brothers, okay? So really, it's just a matter of time now. Thank you so much. I, I, I am so sorry. I know you brothers are busy. Jeff, there's no reason to apologize. That's why we're here. We're here for you. Oh, it's a blessing from Jehovah. Oh, and just remember, even Jesus' parents went through the same ordeal. Is this Jeff and Tiff, is that your mom and dad? Uh-huh. Okay. Now, are they both here at the convention? Jaden? All right, well, let's see if we can find Jaden. How do you know my name? We've been looking all over for you. I'm so glad we found you. I've been waiting here for my mom, but she never came out of the bathroom. Well, your mom is fine. She's actually worried about you. You think you can come with me and hold on to Jaden? Sure, I'll be happy to. Let's go find your mommy and dad. Okay. Oh, one second. Hey, Marty. Yeah, this is Kenny. We have Jaden, he's fine. Mm. We're on the way. That's good. Okay, hold on one second. Hold on one second. Everything's fine. He's on his way down. <laughs> mm. Send him over. All right, sounds good. See you in a bit. Okay, let's go find your mom and dad. So obviously what we've just seen is a dramatization showing what is supposed to happen at a convention when a child gets lost and if you watch the whole thing I've just I've had to give you like an abridged version of what happens but they have this very effective system that they put in place to notify all the attendants all the attendants as you see um, get a picture of what Jaden looks like so that they can keep an eye out for him and eventually uh, Jaden is reunited with his parents. It's fantastic that attendants have this system in place, or at least they're being trained to follow these steps. I think that's brilliant. My concern is that this same concern about protecting children is not visible in other areas. And if you remember at the beginning of the video, 
we were told that without a doubt the care and protection of Jehovah's sheep are a priority. And we saw that in action in this dramatization about Jaden. We don't see it in action when it comes to the handling of child sex abuse accusations among Jehovah's Witnesses. In fact, we see the exact opposite. And what disturbs me is that although they have clearly devoted a lot of time and thought and effort to creating this material that will train attendants on how to find a lost child at a, at a convention, they haven't devoted any time or energy or effort or thought into telling elders to notify the authorities whenever there is an accusation of child abuse. That seems to be a glaring omission. And if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, you'll be saying, oh yes, but we have printed lots of material on child abuse. There are lots of magazine articles and even a Caleb and Sophia cartoon that have, are intended to instruct and train parents when it comes to child sex abuse. But the problem is all of that material is preventative. It's all instructing parents and children on how to stop it from happening in the first place, even to the point where it's almost implied that it's within a child's power not to be raped. What you don't get in any of that material is what to do once it's happened. And you certainly don't get in any of those multiple magazine articles that have been printed over the decades, nowhere will you find clear instruction that parents should go to the police. And when you look into the issue, you find out that there are reasons for that. And the whole witness perception of the two witness rule and confidentiality and protecting Jehovah's name all factors in to why parents aren't told to go to the authorities in every situation. So I just thought it was interesting to show you that uh, that segment because it's rather poignant to think that although they do protect children when it comes to a child getting lost at the convention they don't have the same concern or the same readiness to act when there is an accusation of child sex abuse which is the worst thing that could happen if you're a parent we make bad decisions this disloyal world doesn't think much of promises. We can see that in marriage vows. We can see that in credit agreements. What mattered to him was what you said. You gave him your word. You made a solemn promise. That's what dedication is. It's a promise. How could this have happened? What led up to the situation and where was the breakdown? As we watch the next video, pay careful attention to all the missed opportunities to prevent this situation from escalating to the crisis that it became. Yes, this is the worst nightmare of any convention or assembly attendant is someone rushing up onto the stage during a talk. And what's interesting is that Watchtower probably thinks that most apostates or those who don't like the organization would relish the opportunity to do this. And while there are certainly some who would behave in this way, it's not in, I have no interest in doing what this individual is doing. I am quite happy to share my thoughts on YouTube and if people find them interesting, that's up to them. But I certainly, don't see any merit in disrupting an assembly or convention or kingdom hall meeting. In fact, I think if I were to do that, the rudeness of my behavior in interrupting an act of worship would drown out anything I had to say so that people wouldn't really be interested in any message I had to share. They would purely be thinking, why are you interrupting this special day 
that I've gone to such great lengths to attend. But nonetheless, I'm sure there are individuals who would relish the opportunity to behave in this way. So what we're now going to see is a segment showing how the guy got up on stage, what went wrong, where there was a breakdown in what the attendants were supposed to be doing, so this attendants can learn how to deal with these incursions. Is this your first time at one of our no. conventions? Excuse me, sir. Can you take the sidewalk? That's not safe. Excuse me, sir. So you could see the ocean from right there, right? Yeah, that is awesome. Window. It was it was amazing. Oh, I'm the. Sorry. Hurry! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Welcome. Welcome to the convention. May I offer you a program? So we're getting here a fascinating glimpse into the mind of Watchtower, and we're seeing Watchtower's perception of what an assembly or convention intruder would look like, how he would behave, and what his general attitude would be. It's interesting that when he rolls up in the car, his, he has a, a bumper sticker that says, Jesus saves. So Watchtower is under the impression that if you're opposing the organization, you must be of a religious persuasion. It's impossible that you would have perhaps a secular outlook. So they have this idea that you are evangelical, you're waving your King James Version, and whenever you interact with a Jehovah's Witness, you're going to be rude and dismissive and just generally unpleasant to be around. This disloyal world doesn't think much of promises. So far we've heard about a long line of those in the Bible who have been loyal to him. Today we want to talk about just a few imperfect ones along with our Father Jehovah, the greatest example of loyalty, and how we can take these examples and be able to follow these examples of loyalty. What to say, or perhaps you were very eloquent, and it didn't matter to Jehovah. What mattered to him was what you said. You gave him your word. You made a solid promise. That's what dedication is. It's a promise. Did you notice that he passed 16 attendants without anyone engaging him in conversation? What should have alerted the attendants to a potential problem? His appearance, his facial expressions, his lack of communication, his odd response when handed a program. Any and all of these cues might have indicated that the man had disruptive intentions. At minimum, each was an invitation to engage him in a meaningful way, to discern the genuineness of his interest, or to uncover his intentions. Although the brothers were welcoming and observant, they failed to approach and speak with the man to discern his purpose for attending. 
again, in no way would I condone this sort of behaviour going into any kind of religious meeting and disrupting it in this way. But I find this whole video fascinating as a glimpse into, again, the way Watchtower perceives opposers and its stereotype of what these individuals may look like and how they may act. And you have this fascinating commentary at the end where apparently if you reject the beliefs of Jehovah's Witnesses, this will manifest itself in your appearance, in your facial expression, in your lack of communication, and if you have an odd response when handed a program. All of these are really quite superficial measures if you think about it. If you're going to judge people based on their appearance, based on their facial expression, based on their lack of communication, I mean, what if someone's shy? You know, what if they're just not good around people and not very talkative? Are you then going to automatically assume that they're there to disrupt the meeting? So I find it fascinating that although Jehovah's Witnesses are a religion that prides itself on being spiritual, on, on looking beyond the physical appearance and trying to perceive what people's spirituality is, here, when, it, when, <laughs> when push comes to shove and you have an attendance video that is preparing attendance for possible intruders, they're listing off a whole bunch of criteria for detecting disruptive individuals that are wholly superficial. But having just seen how the attendants shouldn't have dealt with this disruptive individual, we're now going to see how they should have dealt with him. In the next video segments, note how the brothers skillfully discern the intentions of the man and stop the situation from escalating before he ever enters the building. How can I help you? You can't. Would you mind taking my spot while I assist Brother Lee? Would you mind waiting right here, please? Sure. You. Thank you. Hello, sir. Welcome. Can I assist you in any way? No, I'm just checking out what's going on, okay? We're glad you're here. Yes, we are. In fact, we'd be happy to go inside with you and help you find a seat. I just told you, I don't need your help. I'm just looking for something. That may sound simple, young man, but I can assure you it's not going to be. We'll have over 5,000 people in there today, probably. Really, it's no problem. The two of us will go in and we'll help you find your friend. What congregation are they in? We'd be more than happy to go in and help you find the person you're looking for. How many times do I have to tell you guys? I don't need your help. You know, you mentioned a little bit earlier that you were curious about what's going on here. Well, I'd love to share with you why it is that we get together like this. May I show you a scripture that's the theme of our convention from your copy of the Bible? I'm guessing that's the King James. Yeah, the real Bible. You know, I like the King James too. I don't know if you're aware of this, but Jehovah's Witnesses printed the King James and distributed it for decades. In fact, when I was just a little boy, I remember my mom and dad getting a copy of the King James Version Bible right at the Kingdom Hall. Is that so? Yeah. Does it look like I care? 
I guess you guys aren't gonna let me in then. We would love to have you. Yes, we would. In fact, the three of us can go in together. You people, forget it. follow him and make sure he leaves the premises. We don't want him necessarily re-entering the building at some other point, but you may want to hold on a second to keep a little distance. I'm gonna call our overseer. Thank you. We're gonna work it out. Oh wait, I got a call. This is Rick. Hello, Rick? Well, we just dealt with a pretty irate person. Okay. The situation seems to be under control, but I want to give you all the details. I'll tell you what, Rick, right now I'm on the move. Uh, if, you can, if you can send me the details about him so that I can send it out to all the attendants. Okay, great, thank you. I appreciate it. And good work, my brother. Thank you. Please keep me posted. Okay, all right, thank you very much. All right. I think that was his car. Yes, that's him. You gonna make the call? Sure. Mari? I hope you noticed that at the beginning of this segment, we were told that the attendants would be skillfully discerning the intentions of the man. And what we actually end up seeing is nothing of the sort. They never actually find out what this guy's intentions are. They don't, for example, find out, oh, I want to come in and storm onto the platform stage. All they really figure out is that he's antisocial. And as I already argued, it could be that he's just purely shy and that all of this kind of bombarding him with attention and questions could be very off-putting off for a shy person. It's just ironic that the entire premise of this segment is that this guy's motives for attending are insincere and the way that attendants are being trained to deal with this insincere intruder is to themselves be insincere. So you have them engaging in this kind of empty conversation just to stall him and even making expressions such as we would love for you to attend we would love for you to come inside and find a seat when it's quite obvious from their actions as soon as he's beyond earshot that they really do not want him to attend they really want this guy to be as far away from the venue as possible. And again, the portrayal of this individual as just this obnoxious, antisocial, rude individual, it just grates because this is the stereotype that Jehovah's Witnesses have in their minds when they think of apostates, when they think of people like me. When in actuality, it's a small minority of former believers who behave in this way. In fact, I would go as far as to say that if someone turns up at a convention waving a King James version and their, their car has a bumper sticker that says Jesus saves, the chances are that they never actually have been a Jehovah's Witness. They're probably just a born again Christian who is trying to use this event as an opportunity to share their version of what God's one and only truth is. On occasion, the same person may return later the same day or on a different day. Note the final segment in our dramatization. Hello, it's nice to see you. Is there anything I can do to help you? So it turns out this guy was a total pushover after all, because all it took to stop this individual who was bent on infiltrating the venue and storming onto the stage, all it took to stop him was for a nice elder to come up and say, hello, it's nice to see you. Is there anything I can do for you? 
Sisters may be used to assist the elderly and infirm at drop-off pickup areas. They should not wear the orange lanyard with the badge card, nor should they give direction. So you'll remember I mentioned earlier that there are a couple of clips that show the way sisters are patronized within the Jehovah's Witness religion, and that's the second of the two clips where attendants are told that under no circumstances are women to be given orange lanyards or are they allowed to direct people. You know, imagine the horror <laughs> if a woman were to direct a man or give directions to a man when he uh, turned up at a convention venue. But that's the reality you face when you are a woman in this organisation. You are basically a second-class citizen you are looked down on, and verses in the New Testament that talk about women being silent are applied in a very literal way, so that under no circumstances could you even come close to a position where you are telling a man what to do. Time and again, the branch receives positive comments from those who have been assisted in this way. Note how this loving arrangement has positively affected the life of this sister. And what was surprising to us was that someone came out to help us, even in the rain, because it was pouring rain the morning we got here. And my daughter and I were looking at it, and we said, well, where did, when did they start this? I said, this has got to be a provision from Jehovah, because he knows, he said he won't leave us in our old age. So. And we needed all the help we could get. And so we really appreciate it very much to help the assistance that the friends, have, the friends have given us. When you are a Jehovah's Witness, you are very easily pleased. As we've just seen, all it takes is for there to be an arrangement where people who are elderly or infirm, when they turn up at the venue, they have someone to greet them and help them to their seat. That's all it takes, apparently to prove that this is Jehovah's organization, because this is an arrangement that could only have been brought about by Jehovah. No attendant should be seated beside the stage facing the audience. This can be distracting to the audience and is uncomfortable for the attendant. Rather, attendants should sit to the side where they can see the entire stage clearly while being close enough to intervene should an unauthorized individual approach the stage. In the event that someone is insistent on accessing the stage during the program, the attendants take reasonable steps to prevent the person from doing so. In all cases, any intruder should be reported to the facility management or oversight. So that was the last clip I wanted to show you. There's nothing amazing about it. I just find it fascinating as someone who used to be an attendant for a number of assemblies and conventions. It's fascinating to see Watchtower in an instructional video to attendants playing out this scenario and spending quite a lot of time dwelling on what will we do if there is an imposter who wants to get on the stage. Um, it reveals, I think, some level of insecurity. I mean, obviously, I don't blame them for taking security seriously, and they have every right to make sure that there are measures in place to stop this sort of thing happening. But it, it nevertheless, it's an interesting insight into the, the fear and the siege mentality that is intrinsic to being in this religion because when you are a Jehovah's Witness you are taught to think that persecution is part of the job. If you're not being persecuted something is wrong because Jesus said that his followers would be persecuted and obviously this persecution will come in a variety of forms including people disrupting our worship and that's why I am so vocal when it comes to the importance of not disrupting meetings and not disrupting assemblies and not disrupting conventions because we see here that that's exactly what Watchtower is anticipating. They are expecting people who criticise the organisation to behave in this way, to be antisocial, to be rude, 
to be um, evangelical nut jobs waving their Bibles around. And I just think the more we can confound that stereotype and engage in a respectful, uh, productive way where possible with Jehovah's Witnesses, whether it's directly with friends and relatives or just by making videos or posting blog articles or just engaging respectfully on Twitter, which I see uh, a number of ex-witnesses doing now, I think that's a far more pr productive way of reaching out to those who are in the grips of this organisation and helping them to understand that there is something better waiting for them if they can just look behind the curtain and give themselves permission to do research. But that's everything I wanted to show you. Again, the whole thing is a number of hours long, but I've abbreviated it just to show you the parts that are interesting to me and maybe those same parts are interesting to you. I was particularly disturbed by the whole thing with Todd and Todd's mother and the very tangible grief, really. She was grieving her son purely because he didn't want to go to the convention or he was being dragged there against his will, which says everything about the organisation. If you're an outsider watching this, you don't know anything about the organisation, this is what it's like growing up as a Jehovah's Witness and this is what this is how parents are instructed or trained to deal with their children, drag them along, get them baptised as young as possible as we saw in the part about the inactive woman. This is the reality of being a Jehovah's Witness and I find it fascinating that Watchtower cannot make something as simple as a video instructing volunteers on how to be crowd stewards without injecting this cultiness and this control and this emotional reasoning, the highly charged melodramatic music and everything. I just find it fascinating that they just cannot help themselves <laughs> but make it manipulative. So that's everything basically that I have to say on this leak. I don't really know where this leak has come from. I just know that this is an authentic Watchtower video. I'm sure you'll have found it interesting, um, or at least I hope you found it interesting. Please don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you want to see similar videos. And as always, thank you for watching.